also know something else. Those spineless Neville Chamberlain bureaucrats charged with this task have a motto. It's peace through capitulation. So they'd never want to be seen as singling out Muslims. So I just figured, Michael, that they had traded your reputation for peace in our time. Well, we now know this is all true, with the release just recently of those shocking documents you've been talking about on your show. We now know that the UK's Home Office did in fact ban you for racial reasons to balance the Muslim jihadists on the list. So, I guess this tells us something. It tells us that the standard the left supposedly loves so much that we should judge a man based on the content of his character and not the color of his skin is out the window. Anyway, as to those documents, I'm sure they're only going to help you, Michael, in that defamation lawsuit you filed against Jackie Smith. And just to remind the audience, she's the former head of the Home Office who had to resign in disgrace. And these documents will help you because, after all, they contain some very interesting information. For instance, in one message authored by a Home Office official late last year, the person says, referring to you, Michael, quote, I can understand that disclosure of the decision would help provide a balance of types of exclusion cases, unquote. And the documents also contain a recommendation labeled restricted that reveals, and this is what the Home Office said, quote, we will want to ensure that the names disclosed reflect the broad range of cases and are not all Islamic extremists, unquote. And we also know something else now. It seems that this decision for racial balancing involved officials in the highest levels of British government. It might have even extended to Prime Minister Gordon Brown himself. And Michael, the audience should know that these documents also contain something that might be a smoking gun in your lawsuit. They have an explicit admission that banning you was unjust, with another unidentified official warning, quote, I think we could be accused of duplicity in naming him, meaning you, Michael. Uh, yes, Michael, and with these newly released documents, her claim that she truly viewed you as a threat seems like nothing but hot air. But, you know what, however your case plays out in court, there's no doubt that you were sacrificed to fill a quota. I'd also like to remind the audience of why I am on the verge of filing a lawsuit. Not only did the government of England ban me, but Jackie Smith also libeled me in a press release issued in defense of the ban. She actually said that I was seeking to provoke others to serious criminal acts and fostering hatred, which might lead to intercommunity violence. Well, Michael, not only that, but every aspect of this case smacks of political correctness and expediency, starting even with the appointment of the villain in the story, Jackie Smith herself. Listen to this. Just recently, in another shocking development, she actually admitted incompetence. She said that when she became Home Secretary, she'd never run a major organization. She said that if she did a good job, it was more by luck than by any kind of development of skill. She also said that every single time she was appointed to a ministerial job, she thought that she wasn't up to the task. She said that. And she said, quote, I didn't sleep for a week in 1999 when I got my ministerial job, unquote. Well, ain't political correctness grand, huh? And you know what this is like? It's like Sonia Sotomayor, Joycelyn Elders, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and a thousand others. Just like them, it's obvious that Smith was an affirmative action appointee. She got her position because of chromosome configuration, not qualifications. So, Michael, you know what we could say? I guess we could say that your story is one of a bureaucrat chosen by quota who then chose a victim by quota. And, you know, this ought to give all of us pause, because your critics may rest secure in the knowledge that they're not as controversial as you are, Michael, but they should understand the implications of quota selection. Whether you're favoring a person based on quota or persecuting him based on quota, the standard is the same. You're selecting him not based on what he has done, but based on what he is. And who'll be chosen based on a profile next time? Hmm? So I would ask the critics this. Can you be sure that what you do and say will save you when what you are is precisely the sacrifice needed? Think about that. And really, you know what? Some would say it's this utilitarian approach of the Home Office that's most disturbing. Because it reminds me of the old saying, 
The opposite of love is not hate, but indifference. If Smith and her comrades had hated you, Michael, then, in a strange way, it might have been a bit more noble. And what I mean is, at least then, in these bureaucrats' own minds, twisted though their minds are, they just might have believed they were dispensing justice. But the situation in question here is very different. It involved cold, detached calculation. Now, of course, this isn't to say that some of these bureaucrats don't also harbor deep hatred. But of what we can be sure is that they certainly don't love their fellow man enough to view him as anything but a pawn, a means to an end. I mean, these are the kind of people who operate gas chambers by rote. Well, yes, I fit the right profile as a white man. That's why I've said that the name Dreyfus comes to mind when I think about this. And this is just one reason, Michael, why I wish you Godspeed with your lawsuit. Because, look, let's understand what's been happening for the last decade and a half. The hate speech tyrants have spent years, years, using the perpetual motion machine of bureaucracy to persecute people without the means or will to fight back. And even when the Smiths of the world meet resistance, usually the best their victims can hope for is pyrrhic victory. And I'll give you an example. Just take the case of Canadian journalist Ezra Levant. Now... The audience may not know that name, but he used to be the publisher of the Canadian magazine, The Western Standard. And he was targeted in 2006 by the Alberta Human Rights Commission after republishing those controversial Danish cartoons of Mohammed. Most of us probably remember those cartoons. One of them featured an image of Mohammed with a bomb in his turban. But anyway, here's the Pyrrhic victory I'm talking about. Levant won his case, but... He had to endure an emotionally draining two-year investigation and spend $100,000 on legal fees. And as he said, the process is the punishment. It's a go-fight-city-hall kind of thing. So, Michael, we should all hope that you give the unthinking thought police a taste of their own medicine. Well, not only that, as I said, I'm the canary in the mine. The thought police wouldn't stop after airbrushing me from the political scene. It would be soon to appear at a theater in the U, believe me, meaning you're next. There's no doubt about that, Michael. People like you, like Levant, stand in the vanguard. But there's something else we should realize. What is this really all about? Well, the ultimate goal of the thought police's minions in government, Hollywood, the media, academia, and various homosexual and Muslim advocacy groups is not not to restrict us to our own borders. It is to restrict us within them. And with every victory, their iron burqa descends ever lower over those who speak truth. And look. If the powerful and the media can be silenced, the rest of us won't stand a chance. Michael, thank you for having me on the Savage Nation, where there is no phony quota selection, and the only discrimination is in favor of truth and against lies. And God bless you and your audience. Thanks, Selwyn. Good work. Savage. Talk 910 KNEW. Here's Michael Savage. We've talked about the government's plan of socializing our medical systems. Not only would the costs be astronomical, but our health care would be at the mercy of our federal government. Joining us today to give us some medical insight on this is Dr. Peter Bregan. Socialized medicine inevitably leads to cost cutting. The government will withhold treatment from older Americans. Government rationing will push them toward a quicker, less expensive death. At Obama's recent health care promotion on ABC, he was asked a question by Jane Sturm, whose mother, at the age of 100, was referred to a specialist for a pacemaker. The first cardiac specialist nixed the idea on the grounds of age, but another specialist appreciated her joy of life and gave her a pacemaker. Now, more than five years later, mom is still enjoying life. After telling her heartwarming story, Jane asked Obama a critical question. Quote, outside the medical criteria for prolonging life for somebody who is elderly, is there any consideration that can be given for a certain spirit, a certain joy of living, a quality of life, or is it just a medical cutoff at a certain age? Before I give Obama's answer, I want to tell you what he didn't say in response. Obama's omissions often tell us more than his utterances. He didn't say, yes, Jane, isn't America a wonderful country with a wonderful health care system? He didn't say, 
Jane, that's a great story. My best to your spirited mother. He didn't say, your mom is lucky to have a daughter like you, Jane, supporting her health care. I hope other families will do the same. We've heard bits and pieces of Obama's response, but what did he really say? Gladly, Michael. Here's the totality of President Obama's response. 